The title of the text this morning is Ritual and Moral Holiness. Now that sounds like a page turner to you, doesn't it? I wonder if you recognize the text of scripture that was read just a little bit earlier. It's coming from the book of Leviticus. How many of you just went out and read Leviticus this past week? <clears throat> now some of you wouldn't even know what that means, but others of you do and that's why you didn't. <laughs> because where else can you find questions like how to deal with mildew? How to patch clothes? How to harvest? How to treat an itch? How to buy real estate? Who you can't marry? And how to do the laundry? And why in the world that would even matter to God? Because it does. This is tremendously important. In uh, the book of Leviticus, you find out about worship and family. You find out about health. You find out about justice. In the same book that talks about mildew. About commerce and how to conduct it. About property and what its limitations are. About food and what to eat and what not to eat. About clothing about sex and marriage. An amazing book bypassed so much that it only shows up once in the lectionary on this particular Sunday, which is why I picked it, because if I don't pick it, you'll never hear it. <laughs> and the amazing thing is that that famous statement from Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself, Guess where it comes from? Leviticus. Yeah, who knew? Which means that Jesus Christ internalized this book to the point where it issued in his own teaching. He was immersed in the Old Testament. It came out of him even on the cross. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it wasn't just him quoting scripture, it had become internalized to the point that it was him. And as it emerged in his life, he recognized that his holiness as he walked before men was an expression of God's holiness as God revealed himself to his people. You shall be holy, as it says here, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Spoken not to priests by a king, but by God to a people from the greatest to the least. Your communal life together is either a witness to me or it's a travesty against me. I'm calling you to be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So finding out what holiness means matters. Let me give you an illustration. Before there was oil, before there was Calgary, before there was Alberta, there was the West, the prairies which was a vast expanse. I read uh, somebody saying once, largely uninhabitable. Ha, huh. wrong. But tough to inhabit. People came out here, hopped off a train and saw nothing but prairies and they could have walked to the end of their lives and seen nothing but prairies. And they had to find a spot and dig in and live in a tent till they could make a mud hut, a sod hut, and live in that till they could scrounge up the wood to make something else and live the hard life that many of you have relatives that could tell you stories about. And everything's great till things go wrong. What can go wrong? <laughs> Sickness before Medicare, before doctors, before cars. When it hits, and it hits the whole family, there you are in a one-room house, retching, lying there, listening to your children in the same condition, realizing there's filth and stench everywhere, nobody has eaten in days, and you can't do a thing about it because you can't move. Mom can't move, dad can't move, nobody's cared for the animals. Into such a town came two women who were part of the denomination of my ordination way back, decade upon decade ago who said, we belong to a holy God, and part of holiness is health. Therefore, if God imparts his holiness as his gift to us, and we live in his community together, he also imparts his health to us. 
So they went to these places. People said, you'll get sick. They said, we'll trust God. They went into the home, opened the door, walked into it. And of course, the stench hit you as soon as you opened the door. Nobody was moving except for kids crying out to a mom that couldn't move. What do you do in there? Preach a sermon? Teach a Sunday school class? Or get out a big bucket of water and start heating it? And begin to do the laundry and begin to scrub absolutely everything. Home after home after home in a certain Alberta community. These two women went in and cleaned and got people up and cooked broth and fed them until they came back to health. And when they were done, they said, now we'll have church. And planted one in that town. Do you realize there were 2,500 at the turn of the century, 2,500 school districts in Alberta without either schools or churches. <laughs> People just went around to them and planted them. Holiness looks exactly like that. It's as practical as a shovel. It digs in with people because there is a God who cares about them and who walks with the people who trust him and will take risks for the sake of other people. That's the book of Leviticus. Why does it talk about mildew? You ever tried to stop it? How about mold in your house? Ever had uh, allergies that react to that sort of thing? Uh, would you like them spread around the community? No, then live as though you're in community and take care of your home. That's Leviticus. How about, would you like to actually get an accurate measure of scale? If it says two kilograms, that's what you get. You'd like that at the store. That's Leviticus. Throughout my inner life, what's inside me, my attitudes... The way I relate to other people that I know and love and the way I relate to the world around me, which includes people I don't know and love, is all part of a piece. You live together in that under one banner. You should be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. There's a way you act and a way you behave. So, you know, in the Second World War, our cultures proved something. We would be nice to people who were nice. But if they committed atrocities during the war, so did we. Not a pretty story. It was as though they made up our rules. So if they did this, then we did that. I need to tell you something. That won't wash with God. It does not say, be holy, or I, the Lord, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, till you run into somebody who isn't then he can be an SOB. doesn't say that. What it says is there's a rule of life and you'll follow that rule of life if you're my people because only then do you bear witness to me and only then is there any hope for a better world. Live this way. A friend of mine named Ken Key came to me and came to my church when I was a pastor of the church, joined the church and demonstrated the inner life stuff, the family life stuff, all the rest of that stuff there, and I thought, great, wonderful member of the congregation. And he came to me one day with this dilemma. He said, I sell toilet paper for a living. I'm a toilet paper salesman. Well, he always said that to sort of minimize himself, but his accounts were things like Air Canada. <laughs> so he had a business on a significantly high level and was doing it well. But he was a man who recognized that his Christian faith extended to his business. So he said to me once, I've got a problem. I just discovered that one of my clients creates guidance systems for nuclear missiles that kill people and threaten the entire earth. I've got a problem with my conscience in that regard. Dealing with that. But he said, if I cancel that account... I put a whole bunch of my guys out of work. He said to me, Pastor, what should I do? <laughs> I didn't have a clue. But I was able to say to him, I want to validate the question you're asking because most people don't ask that question. As soon as they get outside the house and they get to work, that's it. 
Be thou holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Is I was going to say out the window, but in light of the glass in the street, I'll use another <laughs> metaphor, okay? <laughs> Do you get what I say? Living this way is part of the deal. Ever seen a Hell's Angels? That's a long way from what's being talked about here, but you can bet that if you join the Hell's Angels, they expect 24-7, 365, 360 degree conformity to that commitment. You will look like it and you'll act like it. The Hell's Angels get it. The only question is, on God's side, whether we do. For the scripture continues to say, after it deals with things like mildew, which is incidentally ritual purity, which Jesus Christ has accomplished for us in his death on the cross. He has cleansed us utterly and brought us in. Now you should be concerned about mildew, but not about whether it'll bring you into fellowship with God, for Jesus Christ has brought you in. But he has brought you into something in which you need to hear the rest of what Leviticus says. You shall not render an unjust judgment. This has to do with the justice system. It's your business. Nobody can say somebody ought to do something about that. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. You shall make something so that justice doesn't depend on how much you paid your lawyer. Wow. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. The question that was asked of Jesus during his statement about the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered it that way, is because of this very thing. Because everybody knew, <laughs> if, I, if my neighbor's population is this big, I can handle that. But if it's this big, oops. All of a sudden, that has implications for my life, the way I live, the way I spend money, who I vote for, what I contend for, etc. It has, quite frankly, Deep implications for how women are treated. For though Leviticus begins to speak about that, it certainly isn't the last word. And our uh, news is full of the unjust treatment of women lately. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, not even on Facebook. Last night, Someone slandering a person who was involved in the fatal shooting, or the, yeah, fatal and wounding shooting in Las Vegas a while ago, saying that they were simply trying to profit by other people's judgment and speaking that of somebody who is currently in the hospital. And they showed on the news the wounds to his head. He was shot in the head. Somebody said, you made that up. You are trying simply to get some benefit out of this. Really? I think that qualifies as slander, biblically. Maybe not legally, but biblically. Well, Leviticus says, uh-uh, you don't do that. And you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. You shall not gain because somebody died. And here is a little word that goes in Leviticus just about at the end of every section. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. That one is working its way into my psyche so that I begin to say it to myself. I am the Lord. This is a don't go there zone, Peter. This is a don't do this, Peter. Because now in Christ, as St. Paul has said, you have heard an even greater gospel than they have. So how do you think you will escape if you neglect this kind of salvation? Isn't Leviticus wonderful? You shall not be partial. A friend of mine named Barry Lake worked in the city of Burlington for years as a civic official whose job it was to deal with land issues, uh, expropriation of land, land sales, city to private, and so on and so forth. There were big projects that were involved, a lot of money that was involved, critical issues, people gaining, people losing, 
And Barry would often talk to me about the principle his father told him, and that is absolute justice. You do not regard anybody as greater than another, no matter what kind of check you waved underneath your nose, and you never take the check. And Barry got a reputation for never taking the check. So some people were mad at him because he couldn't be bought. Somebody I wish we had more of. After he retired, one of those people came to him, invited him out for lunch, and said to him, here's a check. Barry looked at it. What for? Realizing he could no longer render him the single benefit at all. And the man said to him, because you never asked. It was simply a recognition of honesty that was significant enough somebody would actually give money towards it. I wonder if our world is that hungry for people who can't be bought. That's what Leviticus says. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. That one strikes me because our laws only go as far as what we do to other people. God's law goes as far as how we feel about them. You shall not hate in your heart. But I didn't hurt anybody. You shall not hate in your heart. And please notice, you shall not hate in your heart your kin. Now, if it's going to get to you first, it'll be somebody who's within your family circle who offended you. That's where the hate will start. The hate simply builds up, I think, over time because I haven't dealt with it. And so all of the things that I might have brought to the cross of Jesus Christ for him to deal with never get there. Rather, they stay with me. And I drag them out like some fetid thing that I've unearthed and buried and unearthed and buried until it simply begins to fester. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. They used to say something to me when I was a kid, keep short accounts with God. That means forgive those you need to forgive soon. Pay your debts very early. Acknowledge your faults right away. Because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor. You shall reprove your neighbor. What's reprove your neighbor mean? Reprove your neighbor means that if somebody else is in the community with you, you don't just sit there and watch them slide away from the community, slide off into disobedience, slide off into bad behavior and say, too bad for Charlie or Marie. Don't let that happen. Now, <clears throat> from everything I can see in the recovery service, they've learned this. What I think we need to hear is that God just not say, do this if you're in recovery. God said, do this. Don't let your brother or sister just fall off the planet and say, too bad. But it's not my business. It is. That's a tough one. That's a very tough one. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. Old Testament and New. Reproving the person who seems likely to fall so that they don't is a risky but commanded endeavor. Otherwise, the community falls apart. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people and you shall love your neighbor. There it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the foregoing is simply saying, you want to know what loving your neighbor looks like? That's what it looks like. You don't want people to slander you. You don't want people to just stand by with their arms folded while you flip off the end of the scale. You don't want somebody to cheat you. You love your neighbor. You see to it that doesn't happen to them. And then it adds again, I am the Lord. Years ago, I served as a pastor and from time to time, people made known to me something about a person within the Christian community whose life 
they thought was suspect because they'd done this or that. On one particular occasion, they spoke to me about a man and said, economically, financially, he is simply not trustworthy. You can't trust him with money. He cheats people with money. And I thought, ooh, this is terrible. Now, usually, and I, I learned to say this to someone, but at that time I hadn't learned to say it. You know, that's a serious thing. I want to go with you to help you tell that person what you just told me. And I promise you, I'll walk you all away. Usually the answer is, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 we just thought you'd like to know. <clears throat> After a while, unless it involved some imminent loss on that person's part that I could head off, I said, well, please consider it and pray about it. I will too. And when you're ready, count on me to go with you to do this. For that's what was commanded in the word. But every once in a while, when I knew that it might incur significant loss to the person, I would go to them and say, I'm not party to this, but other people have said this. I just want you to know. The implication is that you have had some financial difficulties and that there's some things that are inappropriate about them and I'm sure you want to deal with it. Probably five or six times that I've done something like that, I have never ever once had anybody say to me, shut up and get out of my life. Always they said to me, boy, I'm glad you told me that. I had no idea. I want to deal with it. And then I could say to them, let me know if there's a way I can help you. I'll be glad to go with you. I know your reputation means something. Just knowing that somebody cared enough to notice and noticed enough to care makes a difference. For the Lord says to us, you live in community and you live in a community with a holy God. Your lifestyle matters. Your lifestyle points the way to me and tells people what I'm like. Live holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holy. 